What was behind the dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Controversy still rages to this day. The standard version is that the dropping of the bombs saved hundreds of thousands or millions of lives of soldiers who would otherwise have been involved in an invasion of the Japanese mainland. But the truth is not so simple. There were those who profoundly disagreed with this assessment. President Dwight Eisenhower, who was Allied commander during the war, stated, I voiced my grave misgivings, first on the basis of my belief that Japan was already defeated and that dropping the bomb was completely unnecessary, and secondly, because I thought that our country should avoid shocking world opinion by the use of a weapon whose employment was, I thought, no longer mandatory as a measure to save American lives. Admiral William Leahy, Chief of Staff to Presidents Roosevelt and Truman, stated, It is my opinion that the use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no material assistance in our war against Japan. The Japanese were already defeated and ready to surrender. My own feeling was that in being the first to use it, we had adopted an ethical standard common to the barbarians of the Dark Ages. I was not taught to make war in that fashion, and wars cannot be won by destroying women and children. There were many forces at work. Russia was just days away from entering the war against Japan, and there were those who wanted to end the war before that happened and to demonstrate our new power to the Soviets. The Japanese emperor was sending out peace feelers while his generals were intent on a war to the bitter end. The scientist who had built the bomb pleaded for a demonstration test to warn the Japanese of the awesome threat they faced, but their pleas were ignored. Whatever the truth surrounding the bombing, however, one fact is incontrovertible. By the end of the war, all sides had committed atrocities on an unprecedented scale, which only climaxed in the horrific bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Early in the war, when Hitler's Luftwaffe began bombing London, President Franklin Roosevelt deplored the inhuman barbarism of bombing civilians. But toward the end of the war, Allied forces were waging offensive upon civilian populations that were unequaled in the history of warfare. On February 13th and 14th, 1945, hundreds of Allied and American bombers carpeted the city of Dresden, Germany with waves of bombs that created a firestorm in the city, enveloping perhaps 80,000 men, women, and children in a searing, fiery death. A month later, bombers firebombed the heart of Tokyo, and another 100,000 civilians perished. Sixteen square miles of the city were devastated, and one and a half million people were left homeless. Between January and July 1945, the United States firebombed and destroyed all but five Japanese cities. So Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not isolated incidents but rather the culmination of a long crescendo of human violence in the war. David Krieger is president of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation in Santa Barbara, California, an organization on the forefront of worldwide efforts to abolish nuclear weapons. Over the course of the nuclear age, we've spent uh, a tremendous amount of our resources on developing nuclear weapons. We, we probably uh, have spent close to $6 trillion. A study a number of years ago suggested that the United States alone uh, had spent at that time, about the, the mid to late 1990s, had spent about $5.6 trillion on nuclear weapons and we continue to spend on nuclear weapons, on their creation, on their maintenance, on their delivery systems, on the satellite systems which guide them. When you think about it, uh, 
all of this money might have been used uh, to fund education programs, both in the United States and abroad, to fund health care programs for U.S. citizens and for people living in other countries, uh, to fund housing projects, to uh, end starvation. The United Nations Development Program in 1998 estimated that the additional cost per year of uh, providing basic housing, food, education, health care, reproductive health care for women, clean water and clean sanitary sewers to every person on earth is about forty billion dollars which is roughly the same amount the United States is spending each year on nuclear weapons so our choice is which makes us more secure nuclear weapons or basic necessities for everybody on earth and I think the answer is clear the US spends more than 50% of the world's military budgets combined, and that's just in our declared budget, right? And one of the problems with this kind of spending, because one reason it continues is a lot of people believe it's good for the economy. It doesn't hurt the economy. It helps the economy even. But most economists would argue that this is not good, a good investment in what we call, uh, and I, I'm not an economist, so I, I don't know I, their exact terms, but in productive investment. So for example, one could, as an individual, invest in eating out and having fancy food every night, or one could invest in their house and buy a house that, they, that will actually accrue in value and they could sell later and have a comfortable retirement. If you invest in eating out and drinking a lot of alcohol and things like that, you'll have nothing to show for it when you retire, right? But if you invest in your house and infrastructure that accrues value, then it's very productive for your economy. And the reason military spending is a lot like eating out is a lot of these things, uh, the things we invest in, do nothing for the economy at large. They don't accrue in value. They actually just rot and disappear. So for example, when we buy uh, nuclear attack submarines, it doesn't help the next generation in any significant productive fashion the way it would if you invested in their education or if you invested in healthcare and had a healthier workforce, or if you invested in teacher training for teaching next generation. All of that kind of investment is like investing in your house, and it, it breeds future uh, gains. Where does all this military money go? It goes to the Pentagon and to corporations engaged in weapons production. Since the end of the Second World War, both political parties have endorsed huge increases in military budgets. Wars and the preparation for wars, weapons manufacture and the sales of weapons worldwide have become an enormously lucrative business. The money for this war business comes from the pockets of American taxpayers, and in turn, the profits from weapons manufacture strongly supports political parties and politicians who vote for war and weapons over the general welfare of the people. In 1864, towards the close of the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln stated, I see in the near future a crisis approaching that unnerves me and causes me to tremble for the sake of my country. Corporations have been enthroned and an era of corruption in high places will follow and the money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign until all wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the republic is destroyed. President Eisenhower himself warned against the unwarranted influence and power of the military industrial complex. He stated, Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. This is not a way of life in any true sense. Under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. This deep connection between our government, our elected officials, and corporations who receive huge government defense contracts 
is now an embedded fixture in the American landscape. Nuclear waste is a huge problem. Peter Bergell, director of Oregon Peaceworks in Salem, Oregon, has been involved with nuclear issues for over three decades. The problem of what happens to nuclear waste after it's created has been the Achilles heel of the nuclear power industry ever since the beginning, and also it's the Achilles heel of the continued involvement of the military in weapons production. We have these huge stocks of radioactive waste uh, stored all over the country uh, as a result of the nuclear weapons production and as a result of uh, commercial nuclear power that are extremely dangerous to people. The problem is where to put it where it can be kept away from the environment for a, a very long time. Any uh, nuclear waste that contains plutonium-239 uh, is especially uh, important from this point of view because plutonium-239 has a 24,400 year half-life and what that means is that it will be dangerous for at least 20 half-lives which gets up into the uh, quarter of a million year uh, range. So that's a responsibility that human beings have never taken on before and we have already seen that the nuclear industry has been very um, unsuccessful at keeping this material out of the environment so far and has been quite irresponsible about it at times. Uh, the example of uh, the claim at Hanford, for example, that the nuclear waste would be uh, safe th in the storage there for 10,000 years was widely made in the, um, in the latter half of the 20th century. But um, radioactive materials have already leached through the soil, got down to the water table, and made it to the Columbia River, even as we speak. We're talking about managing materials for periods of times that are completely unprecedented. Uh, it has been suggested after much study that this waste should be disposed of in deep geologic repositories, which is like a deep mine and you put the waste in a cask and you dispose it off. But the problem is how do you estimate the impact on future generations? How do we know if it's going to be all right with them? Just in the last 50 years, 50 years ago, it wasn't thought that radiation was that dangerous as we think today. The risks of ra radiation today are considered to be much higher than they were just a few decades ago. What are we going to think about radiation and chemicals and combinations of them 100 years from now? Not to talk of 100,000 years from now. So we've got ourselves a regulatory mess in terms of an environmental protection mess in terms of thinking about how we're going to protect our children. So we're enjoying the fruits. We're enjoying the electricity. And if you believe nuclear weapons provide you with security, which I don't, but just for the moment, for the sake of argument, we're creating this very long-lived waste. And so we say we enjoy electricity and we enjoy security, but we dump our wastes and their management and the pollution from them onto our kids and their kids. And I don't think that's a very good moral framework for society. To this day, thousands of nuclear weapons in the United States and Russia still remain targeted at each other on a hair trigger alert launch status. Hiroshima's current mayor, Tadatoshi Akiba, is president of Mayors for Peace a growing coalition of over 1,300 cities in 116 countries worldwide that is working for the total abolition of nuclear weapons. You know, as cities, we have been living um, under, the, under the premise that many nuclear weapons are targeted you know, to be launched to your city, and no one really has complained. Well, no one, no one has really said that well, that's crazy. You know, we don't want to be the target of a nuclear weapon. And um, just in the Mayors for Peace, we are beginning to point out the fact that you know, your city might be targeted you know, by country A, or you know, this uh, city 
in another country might be the target of um, a nuclear weapon from the country B and so forth. But that's crazy. So we are asking nuclear weapon states to remove you know, at least my city or, or cities in a certain country or region to be off target. The community of Eugene, Oregon is one of the Mayors for Peace member cities. Mayor Kitty Piercy and others in this community talk. I recently received a letter from Mayor Akaba of Japan uh, talking to all of us mayors throughout the country, reminding us that nuclear weapons are aimed at communities just like ours all around the world, and asking me and other mayors to join together to ask if those weapons not be aimed at us and that we work together to be sure that our children have a future. It's like we're creating weapons that's going to kill a whole race or can kill ourselves if, it's, if, it, you know, if it gets turned around or anything. It makes no sense to have a weapon like that, you know? Definitely have more priority in education. I think education leads to better choices, better spending in future generations. Nobody else al is allowed to have them except for us because we're special. I don't think that that's fair. It's great for fear, but I think that if we look deeper into the problems of, of anger and people killing each other, that we could probably use that money in a lot better ways than creating weapons and killing people off that, that don't agree or you know, there's reasons why people are, are killing people and there's a huge inequality. I mean, if you took all those billions of dollars and spread it out and fed people and gave people clothes and gave people enough to live, you know, then they would forget about all that other stuff. Oh, absolutely. One person can totally change it because it's a mindset. It's, it's, it's a setting an example. It's, um, it's connecting with other people, like really connecting with other people and causing a change reaction. Like in one of the cafes on, on campus, there's a, a little sign that says, I'm a traveling smile, pass me on. And it's a trivial example, but at the same time, it, it, it really ex examples how one action can spread out among people. And if we just smile, instead of getting in our own heads, if we just connected with other people on the street, you know, that, that sets a, a standard that creates a social consciousness that ripples out as well. And it's not like I can do something right now and feel the effect immediately. You know, we have to get rid of all that idea of immediate gratification. We have to think that what we do today sets the foundations for greater and bigger things within the future. And that future could be next generation. It could be four generations from now. The fact is, is that we're planting seeds right now in Iraq that we are going to feel, our grandchildren are going to feel. And um, I don't think we're thinking about that. And I, I think that individually we need to bring that into our discourse, our daily discourse. So yeah, definitely one person can make a difference. There really is a simple moral uh, statement basically about the sanctuary of life, how sacred life is. And in Islam it says, he who kills a soul is as if he killed the whole world. With nuclear weapons, it seems like we'll kill all souls. When one thinks of all the events that have happened in the 30 years I've been a pastor, uh, Chernobyl and, uh, you know, 9-11 and all the other things that bring fear into people's life, one realizes that um, we have to go back to, you know, what I always consider the basic gospel values. Love drives out fear. Unless we're really actively working and pursuing peace and harmony and reconciliation in our world, and I think it's taken for granted that we live in a sinful world, unless we're actually actively doing something about that, that the massing of weapons, especially the horrible weapons of mass destruction that are the nuclear weapons, certainly are, are, are you want to say, are, are not what we were designed. That's not going to give us security. The first two presidents of the SGI, or Soka Gakkai International, of which I'm a member, were imprisoned in Japan during the Second World War for their uncompromising stance against militarism in the war. Sunesaburo Makaguchi, the first president, died in jail. The second president, Josai Toto, was released, his health broken, at the end of the war. Toto died in 1958. But about seven months before his death, he gave a speech utterly condemning nuclear weapons, their possession and use. 
He even went so far as to advocate the death penalty for anyone using nuclear weapons, regardless of their nationality or whether they were even victorious or defeated. As a Buddhist, Tota believed implicitly in the sanctity of life, but he made such a strong statement because he wanted to drive home the point that nuclear weapons are an absolute evil. He wanted to root out the very tendency or devilish nature within people's minds that could even attempt to justify the use of such weapons. The people of the world have an inviolable right to live, he stated, and the SGI has continued to promote the intent of that declaration to the world. Mr. Akihiro Takahashi is another of the survivors of Hiroshima. At 73, he is still undergoing treatment for the many effects of the bomb, and his life daily hangs in the balance. Still, each day, in spite of the pain, he continues to speak out, recounting his own experience and urging others to transcend their differences and to take action for peace. We really need to eliminate nuclear weapons from the world. We need to make the world truly peaceful. In order to do so, I want young people to inherit and be aware of our experiences and to make the world peaceful. To make the world peaceful, even one person needs to make an effort. Don't think that one person cannot make a difference. Each person has power. You may not know what to do, but each person needs to do something. If a person does nothing, that equals zero. By one person taking action, things start to move or change. From one person to a second, from a second to a third, fourth and fifth, let's make a circle of peace and spread it. That's what I really want to tell younger people. There are a lot of negative legacies of the 20th century, such as war, nuclear weapons, terrorism, global warming, famine, refugees, oppression of human rights, and violence. It was us adults who created this negative legacy. If you don't overcome those negative things, the world may end. Such a thing cannot happen. I really hope that young people will make an effort to ensure that the world does not end.